All right. Um, everyone good to start? Yeah, I think so. All right. Um, good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, this is, I'm Kat Eaton with JBS International. Thank you for joining today's Ask an Expert Office Hour session. Um, so, come on. <laughs> A few things before we begin. Um, today's presentation is intended to be interactive. So, um, participants are encouraged to ask questions and raise their hand. Um, but we ask the participants to keep themselves on mute unless requested to unmute, um, just to keep sound to a minimum. And we encourage you to turn on your video if you um, are asking a question. In addition, please feel free to use the chat feature to interact with the presenters and ask questions as well. You can open your chat window by clicking on the chat icon located at the bottom center of your toolbar. Um, near the end of the session, we will request that anyone who wants to receive additional information and resources send their email in the chat. If you've registered for the Zoom, if you've registered on Zoom, you don't need to do this. Um, there will also be a link to a post-event survey sent in the chat, and we would really appreciate it if you filled this out. Um, it would help uh, support future development efforts. If you experience any technical difficulties today during the session, please message us using the chat feature or email us at obc-tta at jbsinternational.com. Um, today's office hour session is also being recorded for sharing. The recording and presentation slides along with other resources will be made available to the OBC TTA listserv in the coming weeks. Um, now I'd like to turn things over to our presenters, Lynn Carlson and Lisa Young. Hi Hi everyone, we're so excited to talk to you today. Um, we are extraordinarily passionate about animal assisted therapy, and so we're really excited to get to know us a little bit. My name is Lynn Carlson, and I'm the Executive Director of the 30th Judicial Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Alliance, and we're located in Waynesville, North Carolina, which is in the far western part of North Carolina. We're up in the mountains. We're actually expecting, I just looked at the weather.com, up to nine inches of snow this evening and over the weekend. So. We can only hope. Yes. So we are way over um, in the mountains of North Carolina. We are a rural region and we have been awarded the OBC Addictions Grant in 2020. And we are doing a lot of direct services work um, with youth and their families that have been experienced and been exposed to substance misuse. Um, my name is Lynn Carlson again. A little bit about myself, I've been a licensed clinical mental health counselor for 17 years, um, working primarily with children and youth, and have been a lifelong animal leveler and trying to navigate those two worlds together. So uh, I've also received an animal assisted certificate in psychotherapy through therapy, with animal assisted therapies of Colorado, and I have always been very excited to share my love of animals and incorporate that with clinical treatment. And then we have as a contractor on our grant, um, Lisa Young, and I'll let her introduce herself. Sure, hi you guys. I'm Lisa Young and I run um, our offset program called Log Dog. And so I'm the kind of the coordinator of our therapy and service dog programs. Um, and we have a lot of things that we, um, do we're very uh, blessed and lucky to incorporate our dogs into healing processes. Um, it's my main responsibility really to kind of coordinate all those efforts. Uh, a little bit about me, I do have a, a, a social work degree, which I worked in the mental health, uh, community mental health field for a very, very long time. Um, I have, so it brings my background in a lot of different areas, but I have worked with dogs. Um, I started showing dogs and training dogs at the age of five. Um, I won best in show six years running here in our town. Um, I kind of always have had this passion for animals, dogs in particular. Um, and so I wanted to six, almost seven years ago now, I opened my own business um, and became a dog trainer. And um, it's kind of, uh, again, been a very, a very much a blessing because I really wanted to find a way to incorporate my social work and help people and incorporate dogs into that process. And so, you know, the, the, the stars kind of align for me in this position. And 
I'm very lucky to be here doing what I do, and we're very passionate about it. Um, and Lynn and I work really good together. Um, a little bit about how I coordinate these efforts. Um, our therapist, uh, several of our therapists have uh, therapy animals, the therapy dogs specifically, um, that come to, um, to therapy. And we consider these animals our co-therapists. You know, we have some people say, how do you use your dogs? We don't use our dogs. They, they are in it with us um, to be a part of this process. And so we consider them co-therapists. Um, but, you know, one of the little tidbits that, that the therapists may do is come to me and ask questions about, um, I, have, I have this client that really, I, I would like to see my dog be able to do this with this client and incorporate the animal abuse in this way. And um, what I do is I help train those dogs to do exactly those interventions. I'm also really savvy about coming up with it, uh, individualized interventions myself. And so a therapist may come and say, I don't know where to turn. I don't know exactly this is kind of the goal, um, but I don't know what intervention I can utilize. And so we really brainstorm and we come up with some of those interventions that are very individualized for their specific client treatment. And I was lucky enough to receive the animal assisted in psychotherapy um, credential. And it was a three-day intensive out in Colorado. And then it was also six graduate level classes to get that into. And so animal assisted therapy is many things. And a lot of people have a lot of preconceived notions of it and also some ideas of it. So I'm gonna just kind of briefly kind of talk about it again. It is a very in-depth program. One of our therapists is also doing another intervention through another resource. And we both would talk about how it's one of the hardest like trainings we've ever done postgraduate work um, because there's a lot to this. So we're today's just gonna be like a kind of overview. Uh -huh. um, a therapy dog is a dog that is utilized to help people. And so they are, they go into nursing homes, they go to hospitals, that's kind of those typical. Um, in clinical mental health, we've kind of incorporated that into treatment and then also into the treatment plan and the interventions. And so there's the great part and they call them animal assisted activities, which is like pack the puppy. And there's nothing ne negative about pack the puppy. I'm telling you that the, her ears can be very soothing. Science actually demonstrates that when you're around an animal, patting an animal, your blood pressure decreases, your heart rate decreases. So in that manner, there is, especially when if you're doing trauma work or you're working with clients that are been victimized or had a lot of um, exposure to violence or addictions, that just presence is soothing, helps prepare for people for therapy. So there's, then there's animal assisted interventions and that's where the animal and the therapist are engaging in interventions specifically to tied to mental health goals and um, treatment plans. And service dogs is always like, oh, I got a service dog. And a service dog is very separate than a therapy dog. And I always want to review that, mm -hmm. is that service dogs are- Serve one person. Serve one person. And they're actually federally protected through the American with Disabilities Act. And they're allowed to go with their one person that has been given a doctor's note, and that they have tasks and training surrounding that to go into restaurants, grocery stores, they can accompany their person anywhere. Therapy dogs don't have that ability. Um, they are cats. Now, Julia, and our dogs do go to a lot of places. We go to schools, courts, um, all different places, but with permission and asking. We don't just go in places, and they don't have the same. Um, Privileges. Privileges. So I always want to demonstrate that. And there's a lot of confusion uh, around what that means. And I know emotional service emotional support dogs. dogs. And there used to be emotional support peacocks on planes, and they've never negated that. And so there's not a lot of federal oversight at this moment other than service dogs. And so what you see is there's a lot of fractioning. Mm -hmm. um, what that means this year was in 2022 was the first year that there is now an animal assisted therapy professional group. Um, I'm a member of that group and I'm working on this year to get that in our um, intervention credential as well. But it's the first time that we've been able to have professionals come together and have a kind of an overarching platform. Previously, therapy dogs were mostly volunteer 
and incorporating them into your clinical work, where there's a lot of gray area. Um, the national social work degrees actually allow you to add a therapy dog to your insurance. And I work with my insurance and we also work with our insurance for our agency to make sure we're insured. But that's always something you need to be thoughtful about um, is the liability and aspects of that when you're working professionally with animals. Uh -huh. um, again, we will be focusing on dogs. I did a graduate internship with horses um, and I love all animals assisted therapy. Uh, Israel actually does a lot of animal assisted work and some of the great aspects and new words. Like, they actually use like you know, wild animals and like untamed animals. America is not like that. America is very much on well behaved animals um, due to the insurance regulations and safety and things like that. But there's benefits, I think, of incorporating animals into all sorts of interventions, especially with kids. So some of the benefits that we have found with animals, and this is not just myself, this is there's lots of research on this. It makes people want to come to therapy a little bit more. Children who have been historically not so successful in traditional therapies have really grown success um, in our programs. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of across the board is that animals really bring another aspect to therapy. And you can see, look at how cute they are. Um, it's brutal. It's brutal. And it reduces that stigma around therapy. It reduces that I don't want to go to therapy. It kind of makes it a fun place. And therapy it can be very hard and there's always work to be done. But when you're working with children, engagement is more than half the battle. Um, and so it's really important. That's one of the blessings I have found. Julep is this my lady right here. She is 12 years old. She's been a therapy dog since she was four. And she helps kids testify in court. She goes to summer programs. She goes to therapy places. She goes into schools. We do a group actually with the addictions grant um, at an elementary school every Friday. And the kids, instead of like, I don't want to go to therapy group, you get to go to the dog room. How cool are you? <laughs> and we know that kids already have a stigma when they're coming from really hard places, especially if they have parents that are involved in the legal system. So making something cool out of something hard. Um, I utilize a lot of things around that. And part of that's creativity and part of it's just the amazing work that Julep brings. Um, we also have a joke that if she comes up and bumps you, What's going on? What's going on with you? Because part of being a co-therapist is that she has a relationship outside of just me. And so sometimes I sit back and watch what she's doing and say, oh, and that takes a lot of like humbleness on my part to say, I might not know everything. Maybe my dog knows something different. Mm -hmm. um, hey, so Lynn, can I ask a question just kind of where we're at? Like what's coming to mind for me is, can you talk a little bit about um, how you talk to kids or their families about having the dog in therapy and like getting sure. their permission. I, you've mentioned it before, but I thought that would be a good thing people might want to know. So yes, one of the objectives we definitely wanted to cover was safety and safety is always about consent. Um, so we always, and this is something that we work with, we have policies and procedures around our animal assisted therapy program and all of our therapists have signed on and have really we do training surrounding that. But upon first contact with our office, we identify that we have a dog in the office and we ask people's feelings and thoughts because not everyone is wanting a dog and not everyone finds that a place. So we always, with consent, we have signed signatures, um, signed as part of our policies and the intake paperwork that they sign that they're okay with being with a the dog. They understand the hazards on the dog and we try to mitigate the hazards at every point. Um, that's why Lisa is a dog training professional and she really works with behaviors. That's, yes, it helps with the interventions, but ultimately helps with safety. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have a lot of fears around animals. And so knowing that ahead of time during that first phone intake with a therapist is paramount. Um, and having signatures and consent of all the guardians is paramount. Um, that is across the board. And that's one of the things that I always, we, not everyone loves dogs. We adore dogs and most people adore dogs, but not everyone does. But due to cultural 
health risk. Um, if you're having working with people that have a lot of health issues, you know, there's zoonic bacteria and things. And that's why we always make sure our, in our this part of the therapy it. dog world should volunteers that they are up to date on all of their um, vaccines. They're up to date on flea and tick medications and they don't come into the day if they are not well. And I always ask, and I think safety is always, not every dog wants to be a therapy dog. And I talk to kids, Judah comes to career days with kids and we've talked about dogs have jobs. There are dogs, the police dogs, there are therapy dogs, there's service dogs, there's even avalanche dogs. Um, and I couldn't imagine, as you can see these two, avalanche dogs are probably not the career they would choose for themselves. And they like being on the couch and therapy dog works for that. There are other dogs that, that they would not want to be on the couch all day. So I always think that we have to make sure the animal is suited for being in the office all the time. Part of that is experience and education and training. And part of it is knowing your, your animal and knowing what animal. People always ask, too, who takes them home at night? Do they stay in the office? No, they sleep in bed with us. Um, this is also my pet as well. Um, all so, of them do receive behavioral evaluations. Mm -hmm. All of our therapy animals do have a canine, AKC, canine good citizen evaluation. Um, and so, well, let's see. And that's Maybe actually a good more. example. I just want to highlight the dogs have some level of choice in the matter. We never put a child in a place where the dog doesn't have some level of choice. And some of that is okay, but that's where dangerous situations happen is that if I force them, I mean, our dog, I know Julie, she's been great, but not every dog wants to be held. Not a, and it's really important that you know your animal and you know the warning signs of your dog or whatever animal you're working with is being stressed or is not wanting that attention. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, again, some, that's always the well being and safety of the animal is paramount as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. For the child, for the animal, for us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Three of our dogs are also certified with Therapy Dog International. And so although we don't utilize that certification in our setting here, we do also go out as an agency and volunteer our time under Therapy Dog International uh, for different organizations like Haywood Vocational Opportunities. We go there usually once or twice a month, we visit there. Um, we also participate in parades, local events. Uh, we are on the scene for school systems in the events of suicides, uh, deaths in the school system, natural disasters. We had a really bad flood here uh, last year. Last, last year. year was that only last year? Uh, yeah. We were ready to be on the scene for those uh, those children in need as well. Um, so we kind of run the gamut of anything that would uh, that would require us to bring our dogs on scene and just provide support and comfort in some really bad situations. We're always ready and available to do that for people. And I've already we've already had one suicide in our rural town this year with a young teen and Julia was the crisis response dog. Julia's attended four schools now that have recovered, and unfortunately, that's where we kind of and everyone works here with victims um they the kids now know you love and they're like oh you were here this last time when this person and i'm like this is where they don't recognize us they recognize the dogs <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the dogs it's all about the dogs and you find i actually sometimes you know the dogs drive out the window and you'll hear kids or humans screaming the dog's name when i'm driving through town and again this is rural appalachia so people do see our dogs and then that's why we have vests on our dogs and service dogs are not mandated to have a vest. Um, it is best practice with therapy dogs to have a vest on and we have matching vests for our office. A lot of volunteer items will have it. So people can visually see that this is not just a pet dog, it's a therapy dog. And you always get the question and I always get it. My dog really likes love. Um, one time she had an entire kindergarten class patting her. Julep loved it. Most dogs would not want 45 year old hands on them. Um, and that's where it's really okay. And I tell kids, Julep, you can pat like this, but always ask um, because I always we utilize it to teach good lessons to children about, uh, you know, just coming out in, in public settings and not going up to dogs. And so there's so many safety features that we are able to discuss, and the dogs are always the door opener mm -hmm. for that. Guys, have any other questions? Yes. And we're going to hit on uh, specific interventions too. I know that's really important too. Hmm? 
Do you want to maybe do the video? Just what I was saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to move into interventions at the, because I awesome. feel like, okay. What we're going to do is um, we have a video. It doesn't have audio, but we're going to share the video with you. It's only a minute and 20 seconds um, because right now you see them on the couch, which and we're like, oh, this is Pat the Puppy Time, um, and they're adorable. But I want you to also see what our therapy dogs do as our office. Mm -hmm. And so it is, I think every one of our therapy dogs is somehow included on it. So, uh -huh. And then we'll talk about those interventions after. Yep. So as you can see from that video, any dog can be a therapy dog. There's not a breed. There's not a type. It is, we have from Chewinis to go German Shepherds on our team. It's all about the want of the dog and the training and their abilities to that. We don't have um, certain breeds can't be sure. a therapy dog or not. I always want to just and say that. it's very that. individualized, right? So you know, when someone comes in with their dog, I really capitalize on what that specific dog does very well. Um, like little Oliver, the Chewini that you saw in the video, he works with predominantly the younger children. Um, and he does great with like transitions. He helps children transition from, because a lot of children, um, are, Jess is the therapist that is paired with Oliver and that's her personal personal dog. And some of the small children just, you know, they don't want to come to this, they don't want to come to any office. And then they don't want to leave. Then they don't want to leave <laughs> they get in here. So Oliver really is a mastermind at assisting the younger children with transitions in and out of the office. She's really great at playing dress up, which not all of the other dogs um, necessarily care about, but they will. Oliver loves it because that's something that we really focused on that he's really good at. He really enjoys. You saw him in the video with the full outfit. Uh, Jess has a numerous outfits and the children get to pick um, just some of the interventions that you saw there. Our dogs can pick up toys, clean up their toys, put them in a basket. Our dogs can open doors, ring bells, bring objects, specific objects by name. Um, oh my goodness. We have a full scale facility with all the agility equipment, dog walks, A-frames, jumps, tunnels, um, agility ladders, uh, training tables. And so the children get to engage in all of these activities which is a huge trust builder um, and for the dog and, and the children and the clients, um, right? Sometimes when we get up on the A-frame and it's four feet high, it's, it's really, um, actually we have a nine foot A-frame that I'm putting together now, but it is, it's huge. It's, uh, it's scary. It's scary for both the kids and the dogs. And so they're actively working on trust building together and to see the process kind of come to fruition is, um, is really uh, quite a miracle. Um, and so for interventions, you know, people are like, aren't you having fun with the kids? Well, yes. Um, and I think this is how it parallels like play therapy is that, yes, there is an aspect of, yes, that's fun. And everything can be like playing. 
but it's also how you engage and what that child needs. So a lot of times Lisa will work with a therapist because a lot of our therapists are more in the office and Lisa utilizes the equipment. And so they'll say, oh, this kid needs to work on assertiveness. And one of our kids is a child that needs to testify in court and can't. We're in the prosecutor's office and she can't. Um, she's not at that place. So she's working with Lisa on how to be assertive and has wound up giving a dog show to eight people now and mm -hmm. being able to use her voice. And we're practicing those skills that she needs in therapy in her criminal case and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Um, I have notes. And one of the, you know, one of the things that I was, I've done this one often with families is switching the roles. And so a child usually doesn't get to tell an adult what to do. But in that moment, the kids are actually usually really good with the dogs. They're sometimes better than the adult. And they will teach the parent how to get the dog to jump through the hula hoop. And just using those words, we can highlight family communication styles, we can highlight different ways. Um, um, to navigate future ways. And then we highlight those things in family therapy. Um, it's experiential. And I think we all learn so much more from doing than we do from worksheets, especially children. So a lot of times, one of my favorite is assertiveness, um, passive or aggressive. And I never let the kids practice aggressive with the dogs. We always want to make sure that our dogs are safe. So I have a stuffed dog. This is also weighted for sensory to practice aggressive talk to. And then we practice assertive and passive. And they can have that feeling of when I speak up, I'm able to have Julep or Mavis or Mazzy sit and do the um, things. And then we process how they can use that in their life. What do they need to say, do um, to increase that? Patience, I think, is all patience. Oh, my goodness. Patience is a big one. Uh, and it's, 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 it's very in, individualized, right? But a lot of self-esteem, a lot of coping strategies, a lot of the things that I work on personally uh, with clients is self-regulation. Um, takes a lot to be in that moment. And dogs are a great example of that. Um, I use Mazzy a lot because she has the most energy of any of our dogs here. She's an Australian Shepherd. She's three years old. Her energy is great. Um, and so we utilize that. But again, it's very, we pride ourselves on being very individualized with this treatment and these goals. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really is what someone needs. Um, we recently had a young lady who wanted to teach the dog how to skateboard. That was something that she had seen in a video and she thought that was really cool. So we went to the skate park and we taught Mazzy how to skateboard. Um, and she was a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. um, my hands on with her is actually teaching her how to train the dog. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not training the dog and she, she is an active participant. And I think that's the biggest part is a lot of traditional therapies are sit down and these children, when they're hands on and they're engaging, it's really engagement techniques. Um, they are really actively engaging with these with these skills and they come out with huge smiles on their face. And, you know, it's it's not kind of left with the stigma. Um, it started to storm and you look doesn't necessarily like so much lightning. So she's letting us know. Good yeah. girl, you look. Um, and that's I think that's especially with kids that are in trauma. It's hard to reach them in traditional therapy ways. Um, especially when they've already seen 10 therapists mm -hmm. um, and the feedback we get is it's just not working or they haven't made a lot of uh, progress historically um, and that's the feedback and that, kids that, that we get we find that they need a different way to learn how to express themselves they need a different way to engage and they need their whole body and that's one of the parts of they're able to give and receive care in a healthy way because a lot of times there's a lot of neglect and um, abuse that has happened in their lives, they don't know how to healthily receive and give care. Um, nurturing is a huge aspect of that. Empathy for the animals. I find that the empathy is huge. And I also think sometimes the dog is a safe spot. They don't trust people because their most trusted people have disrupted and ruptured that trust. And so they can trust an animal versus me. And then they also kind of see, oh yeah, if that dog can trust this person, maybe I can too. And so it's again, it's a process and it's always, but it has the experiential and the novel um, 
you have a dog as a therapist. How cool is that? What I found in some of my favorite feedback, and again, I've been doing this from a long time. I have, I have feedback now from people who have graduated. And I'll put affirmations or positive cognitions on a piece of paper with Julep's picture. And they keep it up in their room for years. And I actually, you know, and before all this, we have families that kind of cycle through. I had an older brother many years ago that I was his seventh therapist and he was doing DJJ charges and on the ASD spectrum and selectively mute. He worked with me. We engaged with EMDR and animal assisted therapy. And he has really graduated and done well over the years. And his sister had a situation where she needed therapy. So she is seeing a therapist in her office. And he came, saw me the other day randomly. And he's like, Miss Lynn, I still have Julep's picture in my room. Mm -hmm. I had terminated him like four years ago. Um, and he's still using the affirmation of, I want to say I was, I'm good enough. I can't remember the exact, but he still has that picture up in his room and that positive. And so that's something that it would, I don't know another way I can have a client continuing to use tools that long later. Um, and he talks, he talked to me, he used it all the time. He's like, I love it. I'm like, okay, awesome. Um, that's another thing I do for my groups is we laminate affirmations. I kind of pick whatever the kids need in the picture of Julep. And the kids can keep that as a safe um, part of their world. Um, it's not stigmatized either. Instead of, oh, you have a weird therapist thing. It's a picture of a cute dog. Um, and so I think that's always destigmatizing as well. It's so cool how all of this, like even teaching kids to ask permission to touch the dog and that the dog has some autonomy and whether or not they want to be touched. Um, well, all of that is just so valuable. And I remember from our site visit that, um, the dogs don't necessarily do everything perfect the right the first time. And I thought that was such a, like a wonderful lesson too, that, you know, even if they know what they're supposed to do, that sometimes they just have a day where it takes them a few tries or what have you. And I just thought that is like such a humanizing, you know, thing that, um, it's hard to get across. I think that everybody has their day. So, um, and we actually, you know, it's a great example of a storm here today. And Julia really doesn't like storms. Yeah. Um, and I try to pre-plan a lot. I think it's always pre-planning your day when you have a dog because there is an additional feature. And if you're going into community, making sure your dog is safe, you know, not left in a hot car, not left places. You just have to think about those things. But I try to think, do the weather. But I also use it as a time, exactly what you were saying, Jenny, is Julia gets scared too. How does Julia yep. use coping skills? Julep uses a thunder jacket. Julep comes over to us for safety. Julep might want to be not so touched right now. This is not her touch. a lot of sensory stuff along okay. that too. Mm -hmm. And so we use that as a opportunity because kids are scared. Instead of saying, well, you're scared, what can Julep do when she's scared? It's a safer place to talk about and it's normalizing. And they put Julep on a pedestal. So if Julep yeah. is <laughs> it's okay to be scared. Um, yeah. We use a lot of those nurturing aspects, and even for children who their parents, it's okay to it's okay to incorporate the animals into their therapy. But we've had children that are afraid of animals uh, or afraid of dogs specifically, and so we've gotten tools around that. Like um, we have hand brushes, so the children won't have to actually touch the dog, but the brush does. Um, even Cash, the therapy dog that you saw, Cash, one of his favorite. Um, skills and therapy is she has a first aid kit and she allows the children to doctor him they have stethoscopes they wrap bandages on his legs it's one of his favorite things to do she looked up really um, well she too. looked up that really well too and so every dog brings something very different to the table because in my training that's what I really like to capitalize on is what is that you know if Jess works specifically with younger children how can we incorporate those engagement tools into this therapy or um, so really, we, we really pride ourselves on not, you know, again, and no, no, nothing against, um, you know, the therapy dog, the, whole spectrum, in, the yeah. whole spectrum, we like to run the gamut of interventions here. Um, and there's nothing out of the realm of possibility. I mean, we, Mazzy goes to refrigerators. We had, um, a young lady who asked for a bottle of water once and I said, well, ask Mazzy to go get it for you. 
And she's like, what do you mean? And as long as I have a tie um, on the door, a strap on the door, she can actually go and open the refrigerator and get out a bottle of water and bring it to our clients. And so it's something, even if it's something like you come in the office and you wave, we have the, we have several dogs that will just wave mm -hmm. at someone to break the tension. Mm -hmm. um, so I could go on all day about intervention. Oh, it's so cool. It's like what that. you said about yeah. Mazzy earlier too, about like how she can have so much energy makes me think of those kids that do like, they're like running, 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 but Mazzy can also calm down. Like she's, yeah. you know, she's figured out a way to calm herself down and she uses you to help with that. Like all of these things, um, I just, I really believe in the parallel process. Like, yeah, I, I do too. The best in their vengeance. I come mm -hmm. up on the spot. Uh, what do you think Julep would think? How does Julep feel? And what comes yeah. out next with kids? I can't, I wouldn't have come up in my own mm -hmm. mind, a better intervention than they came up with then. Mm -hmm. And then we go on that path because it's exactly what they need a lot of times. Um, we even have the the balls with the emotions, yeah. the emotion balls, and the dogs can pick those up. Yeah. Or yeah. you know, if they if the children point to specific ones, oh, how are you feeling? Let Julep decide. Let Julep decide how she's feeling, and Julep will pick up the ball um, that has that emotion on it. Um, so it's we have so many interventions. <laughs> it's so much fun too. It's so much fun to watch the process. Because many of our children that come are the clients that show up. They have never seen animals mm -hmm. be able to engage in some of these tricks and some of these things that these dogs can do. And it and it really kind of blows their mind. Um, sometimes it even blows my mind. And I train them. So it's it's very happy. <laughs> um, another intervention that I utilize with my I have a group, boys group right now, kids that have all, all their families have addiction issues and there's a lot in jail and things of that nature is how do we have rules and why do we have rules? Um, and we talk about how it's so important for Jula to have her collar on and her leash. Why is that? And it's, is it mean to her to have a collar and leash on when we're out on the street? No, and that kid's always like, no, it's keep her safe. And, and then it's, we can highlight how rules can be really important. Um, even though it doesn't always like think or look good, rules are really important. Um, so it's always so important. So I just definitely want to, do you guys have any other questions that we haven't touched on? I can't. Robin, do you have any questions? Yes. Sorry, I'm in love with this because I was on their site visit and then I love dogs. So then I can't. <laughs> I love what you're doing. I can't tell you. I've um, experienced personally and professionally the benefit of um, therapy dogs and uh, things fabulous. Thank you. Really cool. You know, I volunteer at an animal shelter and my favorite part, you know, you would think people are always like, how do you do those adoptions? Aren't you sad when the dogs go? And I said, no, I watch people fall in love. Like every time I'm there, you can really feel like this vulnerability and the exchange. And that to me is so relevant in therapy with, you know, people being able to be vulnerable. Um, so. And outside of therapy, and this, this this definitely has the crossover is what Lisa has found a lot is that she, cause she has a private um, dog obedience and behavior um, outside of our work at the agency um, is that she can tell so much about a whole family dynamic about their dog. And she realizes that it's like 80, 20, 80% of actually training the human to re change their words, how their patterns the are, communication their communication style. style versus actually the dog. Um, the dog is the easy part for me. It's usually training the humans. Yeah. And I just saw a cartoon like that, Lisa. Patterns, yes. <laughs> we highlight so many, and she works with adults a lot, obviously, so many relational patterns we put onto our animals. And so when we highlight that with even the dog training, we find we highlight some of those relational patterns that may be not so healthy. Um, and so when we take that back to us, we think about that in our work here at the agency of how we can kind of increase that safety, increase that empathy for their own. Because a lot of people have dogs and like, what does that look like? And then how do we incorporate so their dog maybe feels like it wants to provide some of that nurturing um, well-being for themselves at home, even without any title, just a really great companion pet. Mm -hmm. That's what I find a lot is uh, a lot of clients will take these take these techniques home and start working with their own animals at home. 
And whereas before mm -hmm. when I say you have an animal at home and, oh yeah, I have a dog. But then the next session they'll come back and say, oh, I did this with my dog and it really worked. And they're so excited about it and so energetic about it. And so, you know, I just beam up with that because it's really exciting to be a part of that process. Uh, the last question I have, because I know we're running out of time and I think we talked a little bit about it on the site visit, just touched on it, but just like the culture of your office and like what it does for you all when you're serving clients to have the animals there. I'd love to hear about that. Um, well, I can speak for myself. About eight years ago, I wanted to leave all sorts of therapy services. I was like, I am done and over. This, I'm burned out. Um, keep on, yeah, wait on. And bringing Julep with me every day has re it reignited my passion for this work. And now here I am as an agency director. I meet so many people in this work. We have three of our therapists have therapy dogs. Two of our advocates, for domestic violence advocates, have therapy dogs. Mm -hmm. Um, we have dogs everywhere. They are part of our culture in the matter of. There's usually dogs everywhere. So we always warn people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so and dogs. Have a service animal. Yeah, we have a service mm -hmm. animal. Service animal all the time. Too. In that regard, we always warn people. But we've also now gained the reputation of those are the dog people. Um, I'm okay with that reputation. So a lot of people know us and they will seek out our services. Or I've heard of you because of the dog. And it kind of reduces. They can always ask, oh, you're the dog. We've heard of you. Instead of, oh, you're the domestic violence sexual assault agency that works with substance misuse. Like, that doesn't sound as engaging. It's still what we do, but sometimes it's to get people to come to services and engage because if they're not here and showing up, I can't do the clinical work. We can't do the advocacy. Um, so it's that. We have a lot of safety precautions. Our office is a locked facility anyway, so only staff has keys, which does help if they're done. Every dog but Jula, because she is 12 and she is kind of the matriarchal stays with me, um, has to be on a leash 100% of the time, except when they're in client offices with the door closed and my permission, then they're allowed off leash. We don't want to have eight, 10 dogs loose in an office. Um, even the best behaved dogs, that's going to be overstimulating. So thinking, uh, that was a bad lightning. <laughs> that was bad. She said there was bad lightning. So you were hailing a moment ago. So, but we have, if the joke is, and when Jula comes over to you, do you need to share and is that okay? Um, come here, Julie. Oh, no. Come here, you're good. I love what she just said too. Like, you know, even the best dogs, you know, like that, you know, you have to take precautions. I mean, all of these things again are so just parallel process just keeps running through my mind with, you know, even the best dogs, they might have a moment or a day or something that they're they need need extra uh, boundaries around to make them feel safe and make them be safe. Make everyone feel safe because we always want a feeling of safety for the animal, for us. And like Julep is going to go into a room with no windows right now. Because yeah. this room has too many windows and she sees a lightning. And I'm like, Lisa's going to remove her for her safety. You know, like, man, it's not going to do because it's always about them and the clients. And we're, we need to make sure that we stay. How do we maintain safety? And our boundaries around animals can be very different than others. Mm -hmm. And we practice that with, of course, written consent and just talking and asking questions. Um, I find, you know, when I'm doing nurture each other, GFCDT trauma <laughs> therapist, the weighted aspect of a dog when they're writing their narrative can be really beneficial. And the fuzziness, like healthy touch. So many of our kids have had unhealthy touch, but we know that touch is really, really important in healing. And as a clinician, we're not touching people, but it's really important for that. So the child's able to help practice healthy touch from them. They're able to give it, they're able to receive it. And they're able to set those own boundaries. I don't like when the dog licks me. How do you say no? And then we can pair it. So I think it's always important to highlight what the clinical needs are, but also just how to be this is my body and autonomy and we can say it's okay to say no I don't like that touch and how did the dog and there's we can go down the path of like how to read nonverbal cues dogs are really good at that for ourselves and a highlight very intuitive and we know kids in trauma always have some difficulty reading nonverbal cues or it's frightening and so healthy ways to that's one of those parallels too that we see very frequently 
if a child, our dogs are very intuitive and I train for that. Um, some dogs come with that naturally, but I like to really hone in on that and give that a boost um, and really reward our dogs when they're acting intuitively. Um, but some, th sometimes when children start yelling in therapy, uh, our dogs will go away from them and go and lay down and it. it's a good opener. Well, why did you leave me? Uh, because she doesn't like your energy right now. And it's a good check-in process. But again, it's one of those parallels um, that our dogs are very intuitive. Or if a child starts to cry, you know, one of our dogs might come and get into their lap without uh, unsolicited. Um, and a lot of what the dogs do are very intuitive and it's unsolicited, except by the energy of that child. Um, so that's a really cool process to watch. And it's through. immediate and it's honest and genuine. Um, and I think that sometimes, again, kids in trauma have never had healthy immediate of what that looks like I and mean, there's no games dogs don't play the games like that the dogs are just they don't lie um <laughs> and then you can always talk you start out with oh what is that laggy tail mean oh that means they like and I have had kids you mean she likes me and I they're actually doing the one group I'm doing right before Christmas the kids said we were talking about some safety things he said do you the only person that likes me and I'm like Oh boy, um, you know, and building that highlighted, we need to really build some support systems for that child if they think, and I want to make sure we can highlight that. Of course, we just kind of moved on at that moment, but then I followed up with a school counselor. How can we assist this child in getting additional support people and things in their life so they don't feel just the therapy that I've done that sees them once a week is the most number one um, because every child deserves safe people. This is just so cool, you guys. Thank you so much. I'm sure that people are going to watch this and then have all kinds of questions. So we might be asking you for additional resources. Um, As you know, we can, we did, I know this was an informal, but we, we, we still like to talk about this for hours. So. Oh, I love it so much. Um, my daughter has like intractable migraines, which means that like nothing has worked, like Botox shots, nothing. And the school therapy dog, it's really cute because she comes and lays by her anytime she's in the library. And sometimes the therapist will be like, come on and like trying to get her to go. And she looks at her handler and then she looks at Riley and then she'll just lay there kind of like this baby needs me more. <laughs> <a few> <laughs> um, but I, you know, all these parallels and, and Robin, you said you had a dog that went to the elementary school. Just, I think it's just such a cool way to um, have animals involved with, you know, all of this, they can do so much that we can't. So, um, cats put in the chat, there's a survey. Um, if you guys would take the time to fill that out, that would be awesome. And I just so appreciate your time. Um, and so all the dogs time, <laughs> love how they're laying on each other now too. So they're, they're just wishes of love. It's, um, it's rough. It's rough around here. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you so Thank much. You. Good to see you, Robin. So I hope you guys are safe in the storm and Thank I hope you look doesn't we'll rain and hopefully it'll just snow. We'll, we'll be hoping for snow around here. Okay. I don't we'll hope for snow world. in Nebraska, but <laughs> <laughs> if you guys are snow people, I hope you get a lot of it. Thank so. you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I appreciate you guys for tuning in and giving us yeah, a Happy New Year. Thanks, Thanks you again. too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.